Good morning and welcome to St Andrews this morning. It's good to be back with you after our lovely and relaxing, if wet and cold, two weeks holiday in Wales. It was, after all this time, so good to get away, and I mean that in the nicest possible sense, uh, <laughs> uh, and to have a break and be somewhere different, and to stay somewhere different. It feels so long since we've done anything like that, uh, uh, to actually travel anywhere, really, I suppose. So that was good to have a break, and I hope some of you have managed to get away and have a break as well. Our theme for worship this morning is stuffed crust, as in the pizzas. The Revised Common Lectionary, if you follow it, has been working its way through uh, the sixth chapter of John's Gospel over this last month. And it's all been about bread. Now, you know what happens when you eat too much bread. But having had a self-imposed media blackout over these past two weeks and catching up with news yesterday, I'm grateful to be able to draw on resources from Roots for this morning's worship regarding all that's been going on in and around Afghanistan. But our theme still revolves around bread and whether too much of it is a good thing or a bad thing. So let's begin our worship together as we light a light for worship. We light a light in the name of the God who creates life, in the name of the Savior who loves life, and in the name of the Spirit who is the fire of life. Amen. Let us pray. Our God offers us hospitality, and God's welcome is generous. God is here among us, meeting with us, in our worship and in our fellowship. God longs to meet our needs as we come with hands open and arms outstretched. Welcoming God, we come to you with open hearts and with open hands. We come with our faith and hope and with our doubts and fears. Send your Holy Spirit to work among us, filling us and changing us to become more like Jesus. Amen. Let's join together in sharing the family prayer as we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now, inevitably, when you go on holiday, you take too much stuff with you. The thing is, not only did we take too much stuff with us, we left too much stuff behind, and the weird thing was, we came back to find even more than we'd left. Which sounds really odd, but when you realize you've left uh, uh, your son and, a f and uh, your daughter at home, you realize not only did they go out and buy some food, but they didn't touch the stuff you'd left for them. This was particularly the case with the amount of bread that we had, uh, which is actually, I have to say, completely by chance given the readings for this morning. So we have lots of leftover bread from holiday. I would have to say there's not much of this that is now edible. And I'm not going to show you the moldy bits, don't worry. But we have a lot of bread. There's loaves of bread. There's loaves of bread. There's loaves of bread. There's some wraps, some more wraps. There's loaves of bread. There's, oh, some rolls. There we go. We ate some of the rolls last night, so. 
Uh, oh, and there's a bagel. There we go. That's not all of it, by the way. There was some that was just running around on its own at home um, that I decided not to bring. But, uh, yeah, bread. There's been a lot of talk in the Bible readings, as I said, about bread. And chapter 6 of John's Gospel, if you read it, is quite a complicated chapter. And it's enough to fill you up. You know that feeling when you eat too much bread? Well, if you read chapter 6 of John's Gospel all in one go, you'll feel the same as if you've eaten all that bread, honestly. You feel stuffed. But in some ways, I've got to find something to do with the bread here that's edible. Some of it is, some of it isn't. But does anyone have a favorite sandwich? Don't worry, I'm not going to make you a sandwich out of this moldy bread. But I am going to make a sandwich this morning. Does anybody have a favorite sandwich? Cheese and pickle. That's minor, minor. Emma likes that one, yep. Prawn and mayonnaise. Très exotique, Max. What was that, John? Bread and jam, yes. Beef and tomato? Corn beef and tomato, yes. Sausage and tomato ketchup. Yeah, that was one of the ones we used yesterday. We had some leftover sausages as well. So. <laughs> Paddington's favorite marmalade sandwiches, yeah. Marmite, okay. Egg and cress. Yeah. Lamb. Oh, we're getting very posh now, Malcolm. Pam? Did you have a favourite? Okay, right. Anybody over there? Sorry, I missed you all stuck in the corner down there. Cream cheese and ham. Mm. Brat versed in a roll. Yes, I used to, when we had them um, uh, in Coventry, we used to have the, 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 the German sort of huts that set up in the middle of the city. Um, not just at Christmas, they were there throughout the year, and you could go and get the giant sort of sausages that long in the row, <laughs> which was ridiculous. Right, anybody want to take a guess at what my favourite sandwich is? Because I am going to make a sandwich this morning. Anyone? Marmite. Marmalade. Yep. Peanut butter and jam. Peanut, uh, do you know what? I, when I was living in Shrewsbury, uh, the minister's wife there was, was, from, uh, was from America, and she introduced me to peanut butter and jelly. We would say peanut butter and jam. But yeah, that's become a favorite since then. But I have a sandwich that I make, or I have it on toast, if I can't decide if I want something sweet or savory. And I'm going to recommend it to you and challenge you to try it at some point. Um, but I will make it this morning. And I am using the healthy bread, don't worry. Right. Okay, so we'll put a bit of marge on. On there. Okay, it's got two other ingredients to it. Anybody want to guess what they are? Cheese? Nope. 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 Not tuna, no. I don't think that would be advisable on a warm day in church. No? Okay. Here's one. Marmalade. Predictable. Okay. That's the first ingredient. Now you're going to wonder what on earth goes with marmalade, aren't you? Bacon. Bacon would go well with... I like bacon and treacle. Especially streaky bacon. Cheese would work. Jam. I don't think, you might not get it, actually. Marmite. No, it's not. No, honestly, it's really nice. Now, she won't be watching, but my Auntie Hazel introduced us to Marmite and Marmalade on Toast. It was one of those things, you know when you're little and you get to go and stay at your auntie's and you're allowed to do whatever you like. We used to make potions in the bath out of all the different things that were in the cabinet on the side. There we go. Marmite 
and marmalade. If you can't decide whether to have something sweet or savoury, I'm recommending it to you. Marmite and marmalade. It's really nice. Honestly, try it. Try it in a sandwich, try it on toast. It's really good. We've done a lot about bread, like I say, of this um, <coughs> past month. I knew that was a mistake doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. Bear with. But as we get things, as we move towards the beginning of September, as we begin to think about getting things going again, we must think about what is needed to make a tasty church sandwich. What are all those fillings that need to go in to make our church life full and tasty and rich again? Who or what makes St. Andrew's tasty? Who or, want, who or what wants to be part of that filling uh, that is St. Andrew's? In many of those passages that we've heard from John chapter 6 over the past month, Jesus has been teaching using that illustration of bread. And he's been using it both figuratively and literally. Of course, he fed the 5,000 at the beginning of the chapter. In the Bible reading that we'll hear a little later, it's almost as if the disciples, though, have eaten too much bread. My mum used to say to me, if we went out to a restaurant, when you get that little roll and butter on those posh side plates, she'd say, don't eat all the bread or you won't want your main course. She didn't speak like that, by the way. She was quite posh. Um, don't know why I did that. But she was usually right. I would eat the Brolin bread before everything else arrived because I was hungry and then wouldn't want all the main course when it actually did come. But I think the disciples might have had too much bread as well because for most of chapter 6 we're talking about the bigger group of disciples. It seems to have affected their, their brains in a way. They've become lethargic, you know, like if you don't get a mixed diet. So the disciples struggle to understand Jesus' teaching and they find it difficult. Jesus encourages them by saying that life with him is about dif a different kind of bread. When he asks them if they will leave him, his closest disciples simply respond, Lord, where would we go? You have the message of eternal life. So they make the decision to follow Jesus despite the possibility of trouble ahead. This week, today, using the reading at the end of chapter 6 of John's Gospel, we're going to explore what it means to follow Jesus without knowing what's on the menu. We'll think about that in a moment. But thinking about all that we have to offer and all that we've been given, we're going to dedicate our offering before we go any further. Loving Lord, take these gifts, take our lives, take the rich platter of gifts that we have between us and do something great. Use our offering to give a meal to all those in our community who need to eat something, to taste something of your heavenly banquet. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Lisa reads to us from John chapter 6, beginning at verse 56, about Jesus' bread and about Jesus' word, we're going to hear, we're going to sing our first hymn.
Put peace into each other's hands. It can be found in Rejoice and Sing at number 365. But verse 3 of the hymn sings of bread broken. Of course, this was before bread knives. Uh, one thing we found that we, you know, when you have that list of things you want to take on holiday or ought to take on holiday, bread knives were adding to our list because there wasn't one. But bread is broken here very physically. Bread for sharing with all in need. So let's sing of that now. feel tempted to say follow that. The Bible reading comes from St. John's Gospel chapter 6 beginning at verse 56. Jesus said, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult, who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are the Spirit and life. 
But among you, there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Thanks be to God for these words from the scriptures. Thank you, Lisa. Is it possible to have too much of a good thing? Well, I remember years ago when pizza restaurants started selling their stuffed crust pizzas. Pizza where even the doughy crust around the edge of the pizza is piped with melting cheese. I thought you can never have too much cheese. I thought this was a great idea. I was wrong. You can have too much of a good thing, and if you've ever tried eating one of those, you might have discovered that. It was, I suppose, in many ways, uh, one of those points when I realized that being too stuffed is not a good thing. We've had a lot of stories, as I said, that revolved around bread. And as we've worked through chapter 6 of John's Gospel... But I think I have got to that stage now where I'm stuffed and I'm ready for a different diet. Especially, I think, after having had two weeks of, shall we say, more relaxed holiday eating. I remember my parents recounting to me as a small child the sad story about one of our neighbors who developed such an addiction for bread That was all they ate. That they would have bakers deliver trays of bread direct to their home. This was decades before anybody had things like click and collect and home deliveries. In that sense, eventually, and sadly, this person had eaten so much that they could not leave the house. And sadly, this person died but they had grown so big through eating so much bread that the fire brigade had to be brought in to remove their body from the house. It is one of those stark reminders for me that you can have too much of a good thing. Now turning to our reading today, if you read those opening words which Lisa shared with us, they are repeated uh, a couple of times in that passage a little earlier on. But to the uninitiated, those words, those phrases about eating Jesus' body and eating Jesus, uh, drinking Jesus' blood would sound like some kind of weird lesson in cannibalism, which, of course, is frowned upon in most cultures. But although it, is, it was hard for many of that larger group of disciples to understand, Jesus was trying to teach them the difference between the kind of bread we stuff our faces with and what he was calling spiritual bread or bread of heaven or bread of eternal life or bread of the kingdom. Generally, the response that Jesus gets, particularly at this point, is pretty negative. His teaching is too hard. And they tell him this. In many ways echoing what those people said or complained to Moses uh, in the wilderness after the exodus. But following on from the feeding of the 5,000, they were pleased to get fed at that point. But as time moves on, they cannot stomach his teaching. Jesus doesn't seem to make it easy for them to understand either. 
Then he kind of explains as he draws a contrast between the spirit and the flesh, suggesting that his teaching is of the spirit, but those of the flesh, those who are holy of the flesh cannot receive it. Those who don't have that spiritual soul. It gets complicated, I'll grant you, but keep reading it. The contrast here is between what human nature can conceive and what the spirit brings about. Jesus says that he has spoken words of spirit, words of life. But he knows that some, perhaps most, who are listening to him won't get it. And as if to prove his point, in that moment, many of the disciples leave him. Jesus asks the twelve if they want to go too. And we get Peter's great confession in verse 68. Perhaps this is the point of the whole drawn out chapter. With all its overeating of bread. It is Jesus sifting the wheat from the chaff. Getting to grips with the group that he will work with. For the next couple of years, trying to ensure that they have some clue of what is on the menu. Never has this been more important for us to hear than as we try to reframe our church life in our local community. It is also important for us to hear as a nation and on a global scale at the moment. Now, as I said earlier, I have to admit to not reading a newspaper or watching the television news or listening to the radio at all over the past few weeks whilst I was on holiday in Wales. Deliberately also not taking my laptop with me also meant that I didn't have my other usual source of news updates. So to hear and to read about all that has been going on in Afghanistan over these past few weeks. Yesterday was a big shock. After all that's happened over these past 20 years, in many ways we seem to be back to square one. Whether you agreed with our government's decision to get involved in the whole situation in the first place, after the loss of life and all the people affected by being involved, you can't help but wonder what was the point. Was it worth it? But also, perhaps the bigger question for us is what do we do now? Perhaps echoing those thoughts and queries of many of Jesus' disciples outside of the Twelve, we might well ask, what do we do in the face of the news from Afghanistan? In verse 63 of John 6, we're reminded by Jesus' words as he speaks words of reassurance into a difficult situation in troubling times. He says, it is the spirit that gives us real life. The flesh is all but useless. Difficult words to hear in the midst of a real life situation. If you're fleeing from your homeland whilst trying to keep your family physically safe and together. Yet Jesus continues, the words I have spoken to you are of spirit and of life. So here there is hope. It is heartbreaking to witness the Taliban's recapture of Afghanistan following the withdrawal of the US-led coalition armed forces. It's been a huge shock to people around the world, not least to some of the soldiers who've served there over the past 20 years. Those who have shed blood and witnessed such loss of life that most of us hope never to see in our lifetimes. In the face of such overwhelming, uh, an overwhelming event and the feelings of helplessness and despair it may evoke, it is 
both natural and right, for people of faith to ask that question, what can we do? For Christians, the answer to what can we do is that we must recommit ourselves to Jesus, to answer Jesus' call, that call to follow me. As the apostles ask in today's gospel reading, Lord, to whom else would we go? So they also confirm their faith in God through Jesus. You, you, they say, have the words of eternal life. And it's never more important to remind ourselves of this than when death, including the 241,000 deaths suffered in the Afghanistan conflict, when death seems to have won. For those of you that are Harry Potter fans, my holiday reading book this year was reading for the second time the Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. The Deathly Hallows is the final story in the saga. It revolves around various characters' attempts to claim victory over death itself. And it includes some strong biblical themes and quotes. It was also, though, in reading it, a reminder to me that some try to evade death purely for selfish reasons, whilst for others, it is about the greater good and the saving of others, which might well involve self-sacrifice. We should keep all these people in our prayers, those who have given so much in so many ways in the cause of trying to give freedom and life to people in Afghanistan over these past 20 years. We're reminded in the second letter to Timothy that God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, Paul writes, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Giving up, as opposed to taking a break, uh, which even Jesus did sometimes, is not an option for Christians, no matter how much we may feel like it. So, where and how can we start? Where is easy? wherever we are right now, here, at home, at work, at school or college, in shops, in streets, among our families, our friends and our neighbors. And don't forget, when we say that, what we as Christians mean by neighbor and all that comes with that word. This is someone we need to be caring for in the full sense of the word. The how, how we do it, is easier than it may seem as well. Some of us may be called to work with aid and development agencies. Some with, in political or diplomatic situations, or refugee organizations directly involved in caring for those most at risk, and we're likely to see that here in Leeds working amongst those who are particularly vulnerable, women and girls, Afghans who worked for the Allied forces, everyone whose social or online behavior over the past 20 years may now be unacceptable to their new rulers. And the refugees being driven from their homes by violence or fear. Some of us will inevitably encounter new Afghan immigrants to our own country. And their physical and mental well-being will depend greatly on the warmth of the welcome they receive among us. The head of Migration Yorkshire, Dave Brown, said that Yorkshire and the Humber are ready to take in refugees from Afghanistan. Some people have already been settled in the region, but local authorities are getting ready to accept more. We've heard in this past week that the UK will welcome some 
20,000 refugees trying to escape the terror in Afghanistan over the next few years. Dave Brown said in an interview on ITV News, it's a whole society response to this issue. No one alone can do this. But what we do have in this region, in Yorkshire and the Humber, has always been that when we have been in a difficult situation, emergencies like this, humanitarian need, people come together, do the right thing, and we're always leading the way in that. That's from Dave Brown, Migration Yorkshire. Earlier this week, we heard that some 2,052 Afghan nationals had already been evacuated so far into the UK. We've also seen planes arriving in the UK carrying both Afghans and British nationals. When the first evacuation flights, including nationals and embassy staff, started arriving last Sunday in Bryce Norton, the Royal Air Force Base in Oxfordshire. But over these coming weeks, over these coming months, all of us can try to make sure that we are well informed about the situation of God's children fleeing their homeland. A biblical theme we see time and time again, Afghan sons and daughters. And we can pray both generally for all of them and specifically for persons or groups or communities to whom our hearts are drawn or for those we know to be moving into Leeds or Yorkshire. Put simply, we need to be as loving as we can to everyone whose lives we can influence and trust God for the rest. As our hymn earlier phrased it, put peace into each other's hands like bread we break for sharing. Look people warmly in the eye. Our life is meant for caring. Jesus teaches us to break bread, to share it, so that all might truly live in body and spirit. Amen. Let us pray. When we turn away from you, O oh God, and go our own way, forgive us and turn us back to you. When the way ahead is not clear, when everything feels too much, when we make wrong decisions and our actions hurt others, when we want to give up because it is too hard, when we cannot see beyond ourselves and act selfishly, when we do not put you and others first, forgive us. Forgive us and turn us back to you. Thank you, Lord, for your unfailing love. Thank you that even with all our doubts and fears and worries, about the journey ahead, you are there by our side. Where else can we turn? To whom shall we go? Thank you. Thank you that as we choose to go on this journey with you, as we make decisions and plans, you are there, gently leading and guiding, always present. Thank you, Lord, for your constant love and faithfulness. Lord God, give us the courage and the faith to keep serving you and not to be swayed by the things in the world around that might call us away from you. As we commit the week ahead to you in prayer, go before us. 
and illuminate our path that we can see clearly the way we should go. We pray for Christians under severe pressure to turn away from you, whether that be through persecution, resistance, undermining of authority, tough workplaces, or for any other reason known only to you. Lord, we ask you to uphold all those who will really struggle to serve you today. Help them to know your strength and power and to keep their eyes firmly fixed on you. Father, we pray for those who are in any form of pain or distress today. Some will be calling out to you for help. Others may not even know that you are there. But all need our prayers and your comfort. Be especially close to those who are fearful, we pray. We name in our hearts any we know who may be facing operations, difficult diagnoses, anxiety, or depression, loneliness, or death. We pray for all those who will care for them, asking that you will bring a healing touch, a listening ear, a timely word, or just a friendly silence. We pray for the recently bereaved that your comfort will be very close to them. And Lord, we know that sometimes when we are suffering, we feel you very close at hand. At other times, for no explicable reason, you seem so far away. Give us the assurance that whatever our circumstances, you are there and you do care. Lord God, we pray for the leaders of the nations today. We know, know, though we may find it easy to criticize, so many of them are doing a very hard job to the best of their ability. We pray for those who know you and seek daily to serve you. Give them your wisdom and support. We pray for those who are self-seeking, who lust for power, and who, for whom that lust for power is devastating the countries they rule. Lord, give them a sign of you. Jolt them into realizing that there is a God who desires to help them rule justly. We pray that justice will reign in your world. And we lift to you now countries and places where we know this is not happening. We cry out to you for the people in Afghanistan and Haiti. And we lift the grieving people of Plymouth to you. The families and friends of the five people who needlessly lost their lives. We ask, Lord, for a new determination amongst world leaders to put the needy at the heart of their decision making, particularly refugees. And so we thank you, Lord, for all that our local community has to offer. We pray for church leaders and any decisions that have to be made as COVID restrictions continue to ease. We pray for our local shops and offices and all who work there, especially for those who are still very anxious about COVID whether because it is affecting their business or because they would rather work from home but no longer have the option. We pray for our neighbors and our friends and for all who are enjoying holidays at this time, that they might find true rest and restoration in you. And we commit ourselves to you. 
in all that we do this week. Help us to trust you in hard times, not to forget you in good times. Give us the joy of your presence in everything we do so that we remember to choose each day and every day that we will serve you. Lord, who shall we turn to but you? For you have the words of eternal life. Amen. Our final hymn for this morning is Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. It's 453 in Rejoice and Sing, and it reminds us that we have love and bread to share because of Jesus. We have love to tell and bread to share. Let's sing of it now. joining together this morning in worship. Let's go out into God's world this week with a blessing. May the blessing of Creator, Son and Spirit, source, light and love, feed you and live in you this day, this night and always. Amen.